I'm going to actually I'm, I'm going to come out here a little bit uh, better to do it from this vantage point. And if I need to get my notes, I can. Um, thank you for uh, that story. And uh, after that, uh, I actually woke up. <laughs> um, actually, uh, when I was in New York, I was playing uh, some three-on-three -three, uh, one afternoon with some students. And uh, uh, after the particular game uh, games we played, there was a, a young man who uh, we call when we we're upstate New York, coming from downstate. I grew up in New York City, so every, anything uh, above Westchester County was upstate. So this young man, uh, after we played, and I was I was pretty beat, but sweating, and had a great time with the uh, with the students. <laughs> And um, the, the, the guy said, hey, Prez, you got game. <laughs> That's got to be the best uh, compliment one could ever have uh, from the students. And, and I say that because uh, I've, I've been an educator for uh, almost my entire career. I went uh, through uh, the service, um, of course, as, as noted. but. Uh, I've now uh, been uh, teaching uh, for 31 years, and I really view that role as an educator uh, where we can use our, our passion trying to develop uh, our students into uh, those types of people that they want to be. And that whether that be in chemistry class or teaching leadership or coaching or just being engaged with uh, students, both uh, in terms of the traditional student and, and the uh, non-traditional student, which I have had a chance to uh, teach and, and be with uh, throughout my, my career. So what I'd like to do today is uh, talk a little bit about the leadership. Of course, uh, we're here to uh, uh, share some, some perspectives on that, what I've uh, learned and continue to learn about leadership. And also, uh, really, through this, uh, pay tribute to a gentleman who had the vision uh, with Ralph Hallenstein, the vision to create, uh, in partnership with Grand Valley State University, the opportunity for you all to learn from each other, in addition to hearing middle-aged guys like me. <laughs> but it really is a, a great tribute to a gentleman who uh, has seen generations of leaders and he himself is one, too. And I'm uh, blessed in so many ways to uh, know people like Ralph Hallenstein, a, a true uh, pillar in the community, an individual who uh, has uh, understood the nature of service and of leadership. And I find that to be uh, an extraordinary opportunity for my wife and I to be with someone like, like he. So I did uh, wanted to say uh, thanks, Ralph. Well, let me go, go ahead and uh, we'll get started and I'll, I'll uh, stay with some notes and then uh, go from there and then we'll uh, engage in some uh, conversation as well. Uh, but truth be told, uh, this guy right here, Gleaves uh, asked me uh, a couple of uh, months ago, he said, uh, do you believe in free speech? <laughs> and I said, of course I do. He said, well, can you give one? <laughs> So that's why I'm here. Uh, in, in addition, of course, to sharing some thoughts and perspectives, but uh, uh, th this is uh, your equivalent of a free speech. So you're a man of your word. <laughs> um, well, let me start off. Uh, leadership and leaders. You know the fundamental role that we play as leaders is that in decision making. Okay, so I'm going to come back to this notion of, of leaders in terms of, of decision making and understand the realities that we face that change day in and day out. And if you go back to some authors uh, from some uh, decades ago, uh, Toffler says that change is accelerating. And we continue to see that now through these uh, decades that I have been blessed to serve and lead. But he really has uh, hit it on the nose many years ago and continues to be very prophetic when he talks about change. And in terms of leadership, you'll hear me uh, uh, kind of connect the idea that within the context of change, there's a certain number of uh, uh, oh, values is one way to put it, uh, certain skills that you might have to have in order to adapt to the changes and maybe even more importantly, lead the changes themselves. And you have to know yourself in order to do that.
But I really uh, start off with understanding that change itself is a very, very valuable construct of which to work and operate and lead and serve. And I think Toffler's right on because there has been an a absolute acceleration of the change in our region, in our state, in our nation, and the world. Well, in order to uh, uh, understand then as people and as institutions, in order for us to uh, lead the changes that we believe in, that we have to adapt to the change. And in order to do that, three things. One, we need to learn. We need to be lifelong learners. We need to understand that that's a habit of mind that you need to seek out because as I have said in, in the past, sometimes the truth will change. Because of the changes themselves, there's a different context of which we need to understand and operate. So you need to uh, really learn and continue to learn. Be a lifelong learner. You're going to hear that uh, time and again here in a second. You need to serve. One of the uh, responsibilities we have as leaders, that means that we have followers. But we have to understand that in that connection, we are actually serving them in what we do and how we do it. Service and leadership. Greenleaf is a very good author when he talks about the servant leader. And there's a book that really made an uh, important impact on my life. It was by uh, Greenleaf, and it was called, uh, um, uh, basically, it was a parable about leadership. And it was about a physics instructor and how he believed in the classroom he had the responsibility to every single individual that he touched as a student and that he was actually serving them in the context of physics but he was serving them in the context of life and I really I, I took that home and I, I, I got this book from a, uh, a friend of mine he said Tom you need to read this I just read this and th this is something that uh, may touch your soul but the idea of service the idea of service leadership is one where we take keen responsibilities because of who we are and the responsibilities we have to others. And finally, we need to lead. We need to be able to uh, make those decisions. We have to make those in the context of certain fundamental principles, one of which, of course, is integrity. Others that come to mind, as we'll point out here in a second, but one, you need to understand that uh, in order to adapt to change, you've got to continue to learn, you've got to serve, and you have to lead because people are going to look to you to help make the right decisions. I'll put that uh, now adjective on there. The right decisions need to be made for the greater good and not just uh, in terms of trying to get through something, but to have a longer term vision and perspective that is the right way to, to go. So since this is a presidential uh, uh, series uh, through the Hounstein Center, uh, I'll start off with a quote then uh, and move on. But uh, John F. Kennedy, when I was growing up, of course, he was president. And he said, uh, and I quote, leadership and learning are indispensable. Leadership and learning are indispensable. You have to be that lifelong learner if you want to take on the mantle of leadership. And I think JFK had it really right. Well, when we think about uh, leadership and at our table, uh, Jim, Jim was saying, uh, I asked him why here, why the, this fellows program? He said, I want to learn more about myself. That, that's a very mature uh, perspective. You heard the word, learn. I want to learn about myself, that assessment. I want to grow. I want to understand who I am. I want to understand that if I do that, I might be able then to serve others and make the decisions that are necessary. The right decisions, sometimes tough decisions as well. But leadership is that. It is decision making. And in order to, uh, to see this through, 
when you think about learning, you think about in a formal way education like we're doing here, but you also think about education in so many different ways because we learn through and with experiences like this and with the experiences of others. That's why I like to uh, have these conversations like this where across the table you have the ability to hear and listen from other people's perspectives. And the diverse nature of those conversations will help you as an individual yourself. Education itself is very enabling, I've found. And maybe that's why I'm, I'm an educator, because I want to enable my students to succeed. I, I want them to succeed in my coursework, sure. I'm a chemist, I like them to succeed in my discipline. But that's not the only thing I want them to succeed in. I want them to succeed in, in certain skills that will be important for the rest of their lives, like critical thinking, working in teams, being able to communicate, deciphering information. And, and creating that enables people to succeed. So in a way, I'm, I'm uh, serving my students in, as a role model, but also in terms of of impacting uh, their habits of mind and of heart as well when it comes to, uh, to leadership. I want my students and those that I work with too. I'm blessed with uh, having great uh, senior leadership like Mary Beth and others. And I've been blessed throughout my entire career with wonderful people that I've had a chance to work with and work for. But I do think that uh, what I'd like to have in, uh, in my students and others is the ability to learn to learn and how to think. And you take those together, we can have then great teams of administrative leadership. You have great teams of those that, uh, you're, that you have around you. And I tried to do the same thing when I was coaching. I had a wonderful time coaching uh, women's softball. And I, I wanted them to learn the game, but I wanted them to have certain other skills and, and uh, behaviors that come out of that experiences. And in sport, as in other types of uh, passions, music and theater and, and other types of, uh, of performances, you need to learn the game, you have to learn to learn, you have to learn how to think, and then you can perform. And I do believe that through that type of, uh, of learning from the experiences of others make you a well-rounded individual. Well. One needs, though, to come back to the fundamental question of who are we, then, as a leader? What makes us tick? And, I, and all of us may have our own individual lists of three or four or five or six types of, uh, of circumstances that they know make us tick. And my, my list may be different from your list, but I would encourage you to develop that list. And that, by the way, that list can change. It's okay. You can adapt. You can learn. But I, but I would encourage you to at least write it down. Write it down. Go back to it. Define it in your own way. Then test it out with others as you listen to others. But I think uh, there, there are certain things that make me tick. And one of them is attention to quality. I, I think that... Uh, uh, quality of experiences and quality of uh, how our decisions are impacting those that are around us. Our ability to achieve mission is very, very important. I think quality is one of the fundamentals in decision making because if you jeopardize that, you can see the uh, uh, result and it will kind of cascade in the wrong direction. Certain things you just can't compromise on. And I think compromise, compromising quality is one where you're leading yourself down the wrong path. And the reason why I say that is because as leaders in the decision-making role that we have, we have to make choices. Sometimes those choices are tough. Okay? And yes, sometimes they're easy, you know, black and white. But as we know, that's not life anyway. And so many times it's right in the middle. And you're trying to choose between two goods and maybe sometimes two bads. But nonetheless, 
you want to have certain uh, identified values that you believe in your own heart is important as you make those decisions. I think quality, attention to quality is one. Um, talking about choices comes down to, again, um, another strongly held value I have, and that's uh, uh, personal integrity and the integrity of the institution of which you're serving. Both are important, okay? But it does lead uh, first and foremost with your own personal integrity. And again, coming back to that idea of choices, choices on quality, choices on not compromising your principles and knowing who you are. But integrity, very keenly important. You tie those two together, quality, integrity, and then you start the basis of your own personal character. I'm going to end this uh, 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 later with an idea of what I call my four C's of leadership, and I'll give you a little preview. I will talk about character. Well, I think as we talked about previously, learning from the experiences of others, what really is important in that perspective is inclusion. Inclusion is a very active word. Inclusion is where you embrace all those different perspectives. You may not agree with them, and that's okay. Because you can challenge through debate your own perspective, too. Okay? But you, you need to understand that inclusion leads to an understanding of that diversity is of such keen importance to the success that you'll experience as, as an individual leader. And you, I think, need to embrace that nature of celebrating and understand how important diversity is. But I view it in terms of inclusion because that is, in fact, the active way to achieve the outcome of diversity. That's the difference, okay? That's the difference that I see. How many times uh, do we see and get challenged by different people? And when we embrace the idea of inclusion and diversity, we get to be a better, more well-rounded individual because of that, okay? And as you think about inclusion, the next piece to this, I think, is uh, quite, kind of uh, uh, a, a logical next step. I, I enjoy people. Always have. In fact, I learned more about enjoying people <laughs> through my wife. My, my wife is a natural affiliator. Okay, Marcia is wonderful. She, she, will, she will just gravitate to people. I love watching her and seeing that. She, she really taught me a lot. And part of that uh, is uh, by being who you are and being very collaborative in who you are with others. So you take into account now quality and integrity. You move it into the idea of, of inclusion and, and understanding that uh, collaboration leads to effective teams. But it also leads, I think, to understanding that there are differences, that uh, through collaboration, uh, you are really understanding how to respect each other, too. There's a certain uh, uh, term of art that uh, I've used time and again, and, and that is uh, uh, through your leadership, you have to respect the human dignity of others. You must do that, okay? You must do that. And you do that through getting to know other people. And when you do that, you do that through conversation. You do that through the experiences that, that uh, people share with you. But collaboration is of, of keen importance to me. And I saw it, again, with someone who was so natural at it, with, with my wife, and seeing her and her leadership roles, too, and be very, very effective in what she has done through her uh, lifetime, too. I mentioned that uh, I, as an educator, uh, I believe uh, so much in lifelong learning. Um, the ability for us to continue to uh, learn from uh, others, uh, to adapt to certain situations, I, I think that uh, uh, learning, and in a way, as you are a leader, one of the responsibilities you have is to teach others, too. We, we are leaders who have then that responsibility of sharing some of those lessons learned that we have, just like this today. I was thrilled to get the invitation for this free speech. 
to share some of these uh, <laughs> share some of these uh, these thoughts, and then to expand that out. As a role of a, an educator, uh, we we need to then to uh, uh, continue to share what we are and who we are. And finally, I think that uh, I like the idea of planning and accountability. Uh, this is kind of uh, an interesting uh, part of the story. You know, uh, who's uh, done Myers-Briggs in here? Anyone do Myers-Briggs? A few of you. It's, a, uh, it's an assessment of personality traits, and there's others that uh, uh, are on the market right now. Well, whenever I do cer certain of these uh, uh, instruments, it comes out that uh, I'm a strategic thinker and I'm a planner. I like data, maybe because I, I'm a chemist, because I can use the data to actually argue my point. But uh, it comes down to uh, one of my, I guess, just internal instincts is to, is to plan. Whenever I d uh, did my coaching, I had my minute by minute by minute what I wanted my students to do. In my syllabus, I had it laid out because I want, minute by minute, okay? But I wanted to understand that there were certain outcomes, certain results that I wanted in order for my, me to achieve it. I had to have a plan. I had to have a vision. At the end of the, uh, at the, end of the season, I wanted uh, to have a successful uh, performance by my student athletes and we set up together what that definition would be and then we figured out the plan to get there so you have to have uh, uh, the uh, the vision you need to have uh, a certain set of values that underscore that I do think that you have to uh, have some strategic thinking that goes along with the planning features what I mean by that is Think about different uh, um, indications of success early on. Or as, as uh, uh, Covey would say, begin with the end in mind. That's my favorite. Okay. Uh, Covey is a, is a wonderful author, and he talks about this, the seven habits. Now he has a book out a couple years ago called The Eighth Habit. But he talks about begin with the end in mind. And I think you do that with, with planning. And we do that with an implementation of the plan. And then you have to assess. Can we do it better? But you assess, but you also have one additional feature to this, and that's called accountability. Uh, one that uh, my, my staff understands uh, that, and we, 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 we uh, collectively embrace the idea of accountability. From the quality all the way to accountability. When I talk about accountability, what I'm really talking about is a, is a different model of the chain of command. And a chain of command from the military construct is you have a guy up here, and a guy up here, and a guy up here, a guy up here, and a guy up here. And you, you talk about an up and down circumstance. Now, I believe in accountability uh, for the responsibilities that we have to each other and to the mission. But the construct that I was brought up on was this linear, vertical, accountability model. But through the years, it just didn't make sense to me. Because all you saw was the person in front of you or the person that was underneath you. And that didn't fit with me. So I said, this, I, I want accountability because I believe in it, because there's uh, certain things that people expect of us as leaders. So flip it over on its side. You can still have a chain of command. But now what you do is you're now focusing not on the person in front of you or the group in front of you or behind you and not worrying about people or groups that are further out. But what you do is you put it on its side and then what do you have focused in on? The purposes and the mission of the particular group or industry or business or educational domain that, you, that you're working in. And what you're focusing in on then is the ability for everyone across an organization to lead themselves, to take the initiative, to understand that they have responsibility and they have the, the opportunity to help fulfill the mission. That to me is such a stronger way to understand accountability in a in a different way, a horizontal way. 
I'm very, very passionate about the, because you take into those uh, uh, sense of who we are and we want to hold ourselves accountable then too, that responsibility. So those are so, some of the things that I can go through other types of, uh, of personal uh, uh, perspectives that I have, but uh, those are some of the things that uh, uh, help me uh, along the way when I make decisions, and I do that in such a way that involve others too. And with uh, one of my colleagues here, we do work that way in, in the team that we have. And I think at the, the, uh, at the end of the day, we arrive at decisions and the ability then together collectively to implement those decisions that have the best impact on the university as a whole. So, okay, let me, uh, let me finish off. And this uh, came, th this was uh, kind of fun. Many, many years ago, I was traveling with a very, very clo close friend of mine, and um, we went to a conference, and it was on leadership. And uh, this, this gentleman turned uh, out uh, in his career to retire as a two-star admiral in the Coast Guard. Really wonderful guy, great thinker, good writer. And we, we went to this conference, and we're, he was on one side of the plane, I was on the other, and uh, we started scribbling out some notes going back and forth. And, and together, we, we created the, what, what we call the four C's of leadership. Okay, C, not S-E-A, but no, Coast Guard, that's okay. <laughs> but, but the four, four C's of leadership. And then we use this model in the development of certain uh, uh, programs uh, at the Coast Guard Academy and, and in other places too. But, it, but I wanted to share this with you because I, I found that uh, if you can have something that can link on yourself, uh, four C's may make sense to you. Competency, commitment, community, and character. Okay, competency, commitment, community, and character. In terms of competency, I think that as individuals, when, whenever I, we went around the table here, we asked what major were you? you know, MBA or uh, accounting, uh, you know, I'd said I'm a chemist. You know, we, we have to have as leaders a certain sense of competency, maybe within a discipline. You also have to have a certain competency in terms of leadership, too. You have to know your stuff. You have to have the knowledge. And especially as we move our nation into a different type of economic foundation of a knowledge-based economy, this becomes even more so. But competency, you, you, you then tie in the idea of teamwork, of expertise, working together, attention to excellence and quality, professionalism and knowledge, the ability to apply what you know and then assess so you can do it better or figure out where the gaps were, what you can do again so it can re be reinforced, or what didn't, just didn't work. Absolutely nothing wrong and through that uh, knowledge that you have of throwing something away because it doesn't work, you, you just don't want to keep on uh, doing something over and over again and, and uh, not succeed. But I think you have to understand that one of the uh, key factors in being successful is to know your stuff. Be competent. Commitment. That's, that's a commitment to yourself as an individual and your responsibilities to yourself and the responsibilities you have, have to others. The reason why I talk about commitment ties right nicely into responsibilities because from the commitment to each other, you are really developing a trust. Part of that commitment then, therefore, is underscored by integrity. That commitment to the mission of an organization. The responsibility that you have to take the initiative. I should put that one down, too, as one of uh, my uh, uh, really uh, uh, points of, of uh, value, because I, I remember talking to my children about initiative. And we called it you initiative. And whenever the kids would uh, you know, uh, uh, make sure that the bed was made without being asked, or to uh, go out and get some wood for the wood stove when we were living in Connecticut without being asked, well, that, that earned you a, uh, uh, a Snickers bar. <laughs> okay, you initiative. 
okay? But that to me is, is a commitment to yourself and to the others that you're around you. And then you create the uh, trust that you have with each other. And I do think that there's commitment in terms of both a physical and also an intellectual courage that comes out of a commitment to the mission and to, to yourself. Community. I think I already uh, hit uh, in terms of what I believe is an inclusion. And when you talk about community, what you're doing is as a leader, you need to promote an environment that is respectful of each other. Your responsibility to community is in terms of ethics, in terms of the individual uh, company or business or uh, not-for-profit, your family, your church, other types of organizations that you have. There's certain ethics that go along with your community that you are, by virtue of who you are, contributing of yourself to. And again, the idea of diversity comes through that. In terms of community, I do think that the, there's a nature that within that community, you as a leader are going to continue to learn and help the community move ahead too. Very important to see that. And finally, out of community, you do develop a sense of mutual respect. Respecting others as they would respect you. Very, very important in, in community that you have that, that mutual respect. Can you disagree? Yes. Can you debate? Absolutely. But within that construct, you're not taking it to a personal level. What you're doing is taking it in a very, very respectful manner. And I think that really comes out of, out of community. And of course, to finish off that, that nature of community, to come back to that idea that I shared with you before, that inclusion leading to the outcome of diversity is very important within the community. Now finally, character. Character is what sets you apart from everyone else. It's who you are. And you own that by virtue of the values that you have, how you conduct yourself with each other. It really does set yourself apart. And I think that the, from character, you have then developed uh, that intellectual moral reasoning that is healthy. Because through character, you have to understand that the right things are what is critically important when you make decisions. Character was what sets you apart. You, you have to have some common sense. That's who we are at times as, as quote unquote characters. But nonetheless, common sense is a good trait to have within your own personal construct of character. I think you have to be committed to your own lifelong learning and development. I think you have to have accountable behavior as a person of character. You have to take on civic responsibility as well because as a person who lives in this great nation, as a leader and as a servant leader, you can take those, those uh, uh, leadership characteristics and help others uh, move our country in the direction that we want it to be. Regardless of whether, whatever aisle you're on, it doesn't matter. As long as you take that civic responsibility on as your own and carry it forward and be a role model to others. Others amongst your, your, your age group and peer group and those uh, uh, children that will look up to you in your coming years. Well, four C's, uh, competency and commitment and community and character. Just to kind of uh, keep that in mind as you go about your day-to-day -day business. Well, let me finish off with this uh, fellow's program. I, I see in uh, Ralph Hallenstein the nature of this program and how he has uh, really put himself into this opportunity for you. Because if you talk to Ralph, and we've been blessed to have chances to talk with Ralph, you know, one of the things I found out about Ralph, he aims high. Okay? He really aims high. If you can just think about that for a minute. He had, has had 96 years, and you know, he's still looking ahead. He's still looking ahead. 
He's, he's putting his resources and times and talent into you all because his legacy will be with you. But he aims high. And you should too. Aim high. Take risks. I think that, uh, again, uh, through, uh, uh, through Ralph, throughout his years, I am sure that he took risks whether it be through his service uh, to this country, and then as a business leader, he took risks. So he aimed high, took the risks, and they were calculated risks. Yes, he wasn't gonna do something real silly, but he did take the risks in order to make things better for his family and for his community. He took that civic responsibility to, to, uh, to, the, to the best extent that I have ever seen in anyone. And then, as Ralph uh, would uh, be quick to uh, align himself with some of my, my uh, feelings, learn and continue to learn. Ralph is still learning. You know, it is wonderful to sit down with him and talk about uh, the uh, current political uh, circumstance and what he thinks about uh, the future with uh, our presidential candidates and vice presidential candidates and, and seeing how this all, all fits. Talking about the future with Ralph is talking to someone who has learned all along the way and continues to do just that. And I do think that uh, Ralph is one, and I've seen this too, he celebrates successes, doesn't he? He, does. he, he loves to see people succeed. That's why I think he, he likes to commit his time and talent and treasures to opportunities like this. Ralph Hallenstein likes to see people succeed, and then he wants to celebrate those successes. I see that. I see that with him. So let's, let's take some lessons from, uh, from uh, Ralph Hallenstein. Aim high. Take some risks. Continue to learn and celebrate successes. To finish off, ever, uh, we're, we're in, the, in the fall now, almost fall. Felt like it this morning. But uh, there, there's uh, some geese that uh, usually head south at this time, right? You've seen the V of geese, right? We should take some lessons from the geese. You ever see what geese do? They fly in that V. They have a horizontal construct. There's a leader out there. And he's got all his budzos on his wing. Not this way, but this way. That lead goose out there is working hard. But he also has all the others on this, on this horizontal plane helping out each other that is following them. Right? Now think about it. You, you've seen them. When you go out this afternoon, take a look, see if they're going south. Now what happens? Well, once in a while that lead goose has to do what? He, they go out and uh, kind of go uh, back in the, uh, in the flock and someone else comes up. Well, that, that uh, next goose that's coming up has been learning from the lead goose. Now they're gonna take the responsibility for the others that are on the same plane. They have a vision, they need to go south. They have an implementation plan, too. They're gonna get there, and they're gonna start it all over again the following year. There's a lot to learn from watching the geese. Thank you. Any questions? Should I take a question? Sure. Yeah. I don't know how I'm doing on time, but. You're doing great. Okay. Be glad to answer anything that you have. <clears throat> yes, sir. I just like to say you made a lot of a lot of great points. Uh, I'm actually uh, majoring in education, so I felt a lot of things that you said were kind of tailored towards me. Obviously, you've had a lot of experience in education, but. Uh, just the things that you said about you know continuing your education and how important community is. And, I mean, those are things that the College of Ed, you know, that's that's our base is community and you know, continue your education and be a leader and things like that. So, thank you. Mm -hmm. A lot of great points. Well, thank you. And and with that that uh, way to think, it it uh, goes so much into so many of the different disciplines we have, but really in terms of, of our life and life practices. Uh, that, so, you know, that, that's what I tried to impart. I, I've had some wonderful mentors along the way. 
outstanding people who helped me. Um, and sometimes, uh, you know, got, got me a good uh, kick in the butt, too. Right. And, and that was good. I like that. But I've had such wonderful mentors. I've been uh, truly blessed uh, in that. And so what I hope to have uh, uh, shared with you is uh, take your responsibility to yourself and those uh, that are around you as you grow in your paths, wherever it might take you, whether it be in education or in business or in not-for-profit, within your families, within your communities. Take those responsibilities. We, we've been blessed as individuals, and we need to uh, uh, make sure that we then have, uh, actually, I think we have the obligation to serve. Okay. Questions? Other qu yes, ma'am. Well, it's not a question, but I like the story you said at the end, and it kind of ties up with um, the story that Gleach told us of our retreat. And I think it's one of the hardest uh, points for people who are leading to um, keep in mind that power or the power they have at that moment is not theirs. And sometimes they need to give it up um, and let others lead. And that's, mm -hmm. I think that's the hardest part of, um, you know, being a leader, probably. Mm -hmm. Like, for example, with me, I'm, I'm part of a lot of student organizations, and sometimes um, I have officer positions, and a lot of things don't work, or like other officers or other people don't do what needs to be done on time. It's hard for me to just say, okay, well, it's their job, they need to do it, and I go ahead and fix it up. Mm -hmm. And because I want the things to work out at the end, but right. I need to learn to. Mm -hmm. Let it go and let others do it sometimes. Yep. That's, a, that's a great uh, uh, lifelong lesson, too, that if you, if you do let it go at times and then you have developed those that are around you, as a leader, remember the role of teacher. And um, then let it go. And in fact, you know what we get hung up on more than anything else? I remember doing this. I got frustrated early on in my leadership path pathways to where I am right now. I, I did get frustrated. I wanted it done this way. You know something? Sometimes it doesn't matter if you get it done this way, as long as you get it done in the right way. Okay? My way not, might not be the most efficient, it might, might, might be the um, uh, quote unquote, the way I would do it, but you, we still get to the end result that is very positive for the whole of the community, the whole of the unit. Okay, but to, uh, that, that's an important life lesson. Sometimes you do have to just give it up. There's, there's a chemistry principle. Any chemistry in here? Any, any other chemistry people in here? There's a chemical engineer. There's, there's a certain thing called a state function in chemistry. And a state function means you know where you start, you know where you end, and any pathway can get you there. Some are going to be linear. Some may go about in a different ways to secure this pathway to get there. But you know, at the end of the day, it doesn't matter how you, it, it may be more inefficient and ineffective uh, along the way. But it wasn't the path as much as knowing where you are, know where you want to be. Sometimes you've got to give it up. That's a good life lesson. It's very mature. Thank you for sharing that. Yes, Selma. Hi. First of all, thank you for coming to see us today. We really appreciate it. We enjoyed it. Very substantive. Uh, speech that you've given us. Um, I, I, I was sitting here and I had a, had a whole sort of cadre of questions um, that I was thinking and I, and I said I was only going to ask one, but um, it, it changed when you, when you spoke with Petra here and you, and you mentioned the idea of obligation. Um, and I was thinking about the university and considering sort of um, the, the responsibility that, that, that students have to sort of their communities and I was, I was hoping maybe you could sort of speak on that because you, you look at folks that are sort of in our generation and in my particular area of, of interest is, is sort of Michigan politics and, and mm -hmm. sort of the, the well-being of the state in general and in seeing sort of the brain drain and that sort of thing. Now, how does Grand Valley sort of fit in that mold and where does Grand Valley see itself serving the state best mm -hmm. with, you know, sort of developing this leadership right here in this room to make sure that we're on a good path? Say, Great. 20 years from now. <coughs> Great question, Selma. Thank you. When you look at our mission as a university, and we're a public university, okay, so we have certain obligations to uh, those that are supporting us through taxpayers' dollars, and of course those that, uh, like you all, with your tuition dollars. You focus in on, on that mission. One of the uh, attractions for me when I uh, was being attracted to Grand Valley State University was one word, 
There's one word. That one word was in the mission. It was called shape. Shape. It didn't say build. It didn't say develop. It didn't say impact. Uh, all those t other types of, of verbs, it said shape. And you know, that, that hit me. And here, you know, uh, in, involved with uh, uh, my work along the way as a chemist and in my military service, I, you know, it hit me, shape. And it said shape students. And that's what I was involved with, hopefully, that, uh, in, my, in my discipline and work, was shaping. Shaping professions and sa shaping society. So what we have as a mission is a very, very noble mission as an institution to shape within that construct of shaping then is obligations that we have as a university to fulfill the promises of that mission to our students. And if we fulfill those promises to our students, we will fulfill their need to be the leaders in their communities, to be the leaders in their workplace, to be the leaders in this state. That idea of shaping is a powerful word, a powerful concept. And then, you all, as students, then need to help me. Remember the construct, right? Horizontal construct. You need to help me. You need to help Mary Beth. You need to help Gleaves. You need to help faculty and staff. And by challenging us to fulfill the promises that we have for you. And if we, if we do that together, we have such a healthy university that will fulfill that mission. Please continue to challenge us. Make sure that we we push you as students. Don't accept from anyone mediocrity. Accept only quality. Be accountable yourself and hold us accountable too. And from that, we will then create the type of university we want for the future. We will attract future students who want to be part of us. And then in turn, the graduates will get the skills and abilities to be successful well beyond Grand Valley as they go out into different learning modes and different service modes as well. But that, some of you right on, I think though that it's a, it's a mutual interdependence between the faculty, staff, and the students that will make us successful. Thank you. Yes, ma'am. One more question. that also relates to the university. When you were looking at the possibility and the prospect of coming in and becoming um, a guiding figure for the, not only the school but for the future of the school, how did you feel for embracing the challenge of the fact that this um, hasn't been in the past a leading university in the state um, where we're competing for public, um, I guess you would say, knowledge um, and understanding with um, universities like the University of Michigan, um, Michigan Tech, Michigan State University. I mean, these are vast different audiences and how did you feel up to the challenge for that? Because that is a huge thing in leadership and so mm -hmm. many different directions you could go. I mean, did that kind of feel like scary? <laughs> uh, <laughs> not, not scary, but, uh, but an enormous uh, responsibility and I think uh, here at Grand Valley, another part of this idea of shaping, then as you drill down to see what the uh, fundamental values are of this university, I come to the idea of liberal education. And the nature of liberal education within the breadth that we want as people. And liberal education gives you a number of those uh, uh, what I call uh, learning outcomes of critical thinking and teamwork and communication and, and other types of uh, understanding of, of, of history and of fine arts and uh, you know the, the whole person perspective again. And then you have some very great uh, abilities to delve into professions but underscored by a very, very strong complement with liberal education principles. Uh, an author, uh, Cardinal Newman, back in the 1800s, talked about the uh, idea of a university. And I embrace that. In fact, my, one of my colleagues, 
uh, an English professor at the Coast Guard Academy when I retired the first time. I've, re I've retired twice. But the first time when I retired my uniform, she, she knew I was going out to Iowa where I was going to be a uh, vice president for academic affairs and student affairs at a liberal arts college. She said, you might really enjoy reading this book. And I did. And it was, it was intellectually as challenging of a book I've ever read, but I couldn't put it down. And in there, he talked about the nature of liberal education and how important it was that we provided our students the opportunity to choose where they wanted to go with their profession, but also had it as a foundation. So here, to come back to your question, Grand Valley State University, with that construct, we have a particular niche and mission and it's very strongly underscored by this liberal education. We're a comprehensive university, which means that we offer uh, an excellent undergraduate program, excellent graduate programs too. And we're known for that through uh, numbers of uh, national uh, reputational uh, assessments, like US News and World Report and others. But that, uh, that idea of, of a particular niche here in Michigan is very strong. We're not a University of Michigan. They have a, I graduated from U of M, uh, and I'm pleased with that background that I received at the master's degree level. Uh, we're not a Michigan Tech. We're not, we are Grand Valley. We're proud of that, too. So what attracted me was, yes, the idea of the mission and also the niche that we have here for the state. And I want to continue the growth in a reputation and the delivery on the promises as a comprehensive university that is underscored and underpinned with a very strong liberal education. So thank you. Thank you very much.